Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Chipi Wachibengwa, and I'm the CEO of the Tourism Business Council of South Africa. And uh, today we are joined by Alan, uh, who works um, you know, for the Department of Labor, of course, UIF, falls under Department of Labor. And we have pulled together this webinar to deal with issues around UIF. And uh, thank you, Alan, for joining us. Uh, and the reason why we're doing this is because, as you all know, um, we, when the president announced the extension of uh, the UIFTS program, we as the tourism industry are one of those industries that were specifically mentioned as an industry that would, uh, uh, would be, you know, prioritized or benefit from this extension. And, uh, you know, that came with, uh, you know, also some challenges in terms of how to do it properly and how to ensure that, uh, you know, indeed, uh, those that are, um, are supposed to benefit will benefit. And that came with issues of, you know, uh, how you apply uh, the sick codes uh, and many other issues, you know, that came with that. And also we do recognize that there are others that may not have received their UIF TS money uh, from the previous months or since the beginning of the UIF uh, TS program. So we aim to deal with those issues at this uh, you know, webinar. Of course, uh, you're gonna have many questions that are similar. We're gonna try to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, uh, when I say we, I mean Alan um, is gonna try to answer as many questions as, uh, as he can. And uh, you know, our job here is to make sure that you know, we facilitate uh, this, uh, this conversation and to make sure that the questions that are, that are being raised uh, you know, are being dealt with. We have Natalia who's uh, you know, assisting us with the system and making sure that uh, you know, we capture as many questions as possible and we classify them uh, so that we can have you know, as many answers as possible. What I'm going to ask is that uh, we all need to, you know, listen attentively to the answers that have been given, so that we we avoid asking similar questions or same questions, uh, and you know we can therefore answer as many questions. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck uh, in, uh, in in one or two questions. So we're gonna we're gonna have to do that, uh, and we're gonna have to to ensure that uh, you know we um, we get to as many as possible. Uh, Natalia, are there any other housekeeping, uh, uh, you know, issues that you want to raise before we start? Thanks, Chief. Just quickly, and I have pasted it in the chat. Due to the volume of questions we are likely to get today, I would ask for you to please add these to the Q and A folder at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat. I will not be monitoring the chat for questions. I will also not be taking verbal questions. So don't raise your hand because I won't be unmuting you. If you need to ask a question, please ask it in the Q&A so that I can keep it tidy. Thanks so much. That's it, Chief. Thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, before we start, I'm going to give Alan, uh, you know, so he can say some few words and perhaps by saying some few words, he may be able to answer some of the questions that you, 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 you may have raised. Alan, over to you. We have in about an hour and... Uh, you know, few minutes uh, to deal with this situation and over to you uh, as a start. Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome to everyone that, that's listening in. Um, as indicated, my name is Alan Raghavelu. I'm from the Unemployment Insurance Fund within the Department of Employment and Labor. Yes, let me go on to TAS first. Now TAS, you can divide it into two phases. Uh, phase one from the 27th of March to the 15th of October and phase two from the 16th of October to the 15th of March. Um, that is what's announced and that is pronounced and that is as per the directive. Now I will concentrate more on the phase two, which is from the 16th of October to the 15th of March, because phase one was open to all employers, all sectors. Now, if you listen to the uh, state president's speech during the state of the nation address, he indicated extension of chairs and he also indicated for those sectors. And he went one step further to indicate those sectors will be confirmed after negoti negotiation during the NEDLAC process. Now, NEDLAC has concluded on that, and it was part of our directive. It was decided certain businesses or certain business establishment will be catered for in terms of the extension of TAS. And it is indicated in NHTA of the directive. And just give you one or two examples. You have cinemas, you have theaters, you have restaurants, 
uh, you have venue hosting action is right up to number 23 and number 24 give the discretion powers to the unemployment insurance fund to look at end-to-end -end processing i will explain about the end-to-end -end processing now if you look at the directive the directive that covers the extension covers it in three parts part one is sector based that is only those sectors that meet those business activities indicated in Annex A. And those sectors namely covers three major portions, which is the hospitality, which is the tourism and the liquor. But you can also look at value added uh, activities. For example, within the liquor, you can concentrate on the transportation of those that are transporting liquor. Agriculture, those products that lead to the manufacturing of liquor. That is what I'm looking at end-to-end -end processes. But if there's any questions further on that, I can give it clarity. I'm just giving an overview so we can concentrate on the specific question. The second part of it covers the non-sector. It's open to all businesses in all sectors, all employers. Now, what is the second part? The second part covers the comorbidities, the covers the vulnerable in terms of age, and covers their isolation and quarantine. That should be opened on the 22nd of April for employers to lodge the claims. It was supposed to be opened on the 13th of April. However, there's certain issues that we have to clarify between ourselves and ELP, and that is almost finalized, and that will be opened on the 22nd. Now, the third part of it is you're looking at reduced work time or temporary layoffs via the normal UF processes. Those sectors that don't qualify, we do not meet the criteria as indicated in Annex A, then they can go via the normal UI processes. The benefit calculator or the formula is very similar. The only different, major difference between the test calculation and the UI calculation is the minimum wage of 3,500. So we looked at the three categories. Those are covered under test and those are not covered under test. Now let's go back in terms of the activities that were covered. The key thing for us to consider and it was discussed during the NEDLAC process, how do we control it? How do we control those businesses that are indicated as part of Annex JA, and those are only in terms of qualifying employers or employees, and we are 100% sure, and then those things go to the system. So we looked at the SIP codes with the sector industrial classification, and we preloaded the codes from South African Revenue Services, and it was done before we opened the portal. So those codes were checked, were verified, and if it met the business activities, then it was accepted to the portal. However, the certain applications or certain applications were lodged by certain employees were rejected, right? Now, we did not allow the process of reviewing it because we got to take into the consideration of the AG process in the first three months, where AG indi indicated that you've got your controls got to be in such a design in such a way that you only allow those that qualifies. So we allowed for the appeal process. Those employees that feel they meet the business activities, but for some reason, the codes are showing incorrectly on SARS. Then we allow for the appeal process. And the appeal process is via um, the call center where the call is logged. So there you've got to touch in a pro forma and touch in your supporting documentation. And if your supporting documentation matches the business activities, then you are allowed to lodge an application. So the key thing in terms of phase two, the first part of it is sector-based, sectors or businesses that meet the business activities in energy A, and we are controlling it by the SIP codes and the SIP codes we got from South African Revenue Services and the SIP codes, if it indicates one of the business activities you are allowed or giving permission or you're permitted to, to, to allow. If you are rejected, it means you do not meet the criteria. However, there could be employers or employees out there that are dissatisfied with the rejection and the rejection process is by the appeals. Now, I'll briefly touch on the phase one uh, part of it. With the phase one, we only have a closure date. That means we're not accepting new applications into the system because we allowed the employers, employees sufficient time to lodge the application. And each iteration period had a closure date from the 25th of September to the 15th of October to the 30th of October to 31st December. So whatever claims were lodged and lodged successfully, right? Where process and some that were rejected are being reviewed. Now, why rejected and reviewed? 
it was rejected because it could be that the declarations was not 100%. It could be re rejected because some of the input data was not 100%. And then employers were given the opportunity to correct. And once they corrected, we are rerunning it. Now, in terms of our payment schedule for the first iteration part, uh, part one, or phase one, as you call it, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, is set aside to rerun all rejected what could be corrected by the employers. And if you see in our payment processes, we are still paying for part one or phase one on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We, we are also paying in terms of the discrepancies, the correction by employers, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We are also paying the failed CSVs that were issues or problematic or corrupt, and those things were resubmitted. And if there's proof that they submitted beyond or before closure time, they are being processed and being paid. Thursday, Friday is set aside for phase two, which is a sector based, non sector based. And as I said, the non sector based will be open for public from the 22nd of April. It's supposed to be on the 13th of April, but it's been extended uh, and be open on the 22nd of April. Let me stop there. That's a brief overview I want to give. Then, if there's any specific questions, I can elaborate and bring in more information. But this is just to set the scene. Over to you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Natalia will then go through the questions that are coming through, and then we can deal you know, with those questions. Okay. Over to you, Natalia. Thanks, Chief. So you said if there are any questions, Alan, there are lots of questions. I hope you've buckled up. Right. So the first question is, I'm trying to get assistance with my U filing since March 2020. My first and only reply was received in March, and I still cannot access my declarations or anything when I log into U filing. And when I call, they only request me to send an email. Can you maybe just for the general um, specific, everybody's understanding, explain why we need to communicate on email and submit on email and also give us the call center number if there's a call center number so we can just answer about four of the questions that have come through. Okay, yes, I will give you the call center numbers. Now, in terms of the access to U filing, the U filing is a portal that is used by employers and employees. And, and the U filing portal was mainly in forms of the registration, declaration, and submission of the employee's details. However, you got to register. When you register, there are certain security checks done that you are the employer or representative of that employer. In the second portion of the U filing, we have the online claims portion where an individual can lodge a claim online instead of going through a labor center. And that became uh, uh, handy uh, in terms of us, both the public and the department. So we avoided the face-to-face -face contact. So we are getting a large amount of, of claims through the online process and a large amount of declaration through the online process. Why? Because employers did not declare timelessly prior to lockdown. Now they're only declaring, and I must say this, they only started declaring timelessly and diligently when they wanted test payments. Now, in terms of compliance, in terms of the law, that should not be the case. The law says, as soon as you start your establishment and you, and you employ employees or contributors, you must register your business. And in terms of declarations, as per the amendment of the amendment UI Act, it says declaration might be submitted monthly before the seventh of each month. And if that was done diligently, then we shouldn't be sitting with a problem of lack of declarations or issues on new filing. That's the first issue. However, due to the volume in intake, because you had a large number of employers getting onto the system to declare so they can be paid tests, there was issues in terms of the traffic, the issues in terms of the access into the portal and in terms of technical issues. Now we have established new filing champions in every province and the new filing champions in every province are there to assist the employers to navigate and to correct their access problems because there has to be in terms of security checks in terms of access and the issues then we don't, don't allow uh, in terms of gaining access and entering into the online portal because it has to be security based. So yes, you got to call in, they got to do security checks that you are generally the person, the employer and then give you access. And unfortunately, it has to be done because we're having a lot of fraudulent transactions on the system and by persons other than the employer themselves. So yes, I think it was requested in terms of the, um, the call center 
and I will give you the call center number as, 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 as I'm flipping through my documentation. And I think uh, the, the Percy on my, on my left will give me the call center number and I will give it to you at the end of the session. So the question is, yes, you got your phone, the call center agent in terms of gaining access when there's issues in terms of uh, your security checks. And once you are given the clearance, then you begin access into the portal. Thank you, Alan. So a lot of people have asked that question about being able to access the system. I hope that that has helped you answer that specific question. Um, Alan, can you unpack this appeal process for us? We have a lot of people asking us how to go about appealing, what the length of time is that they would be expected to wait. Are they required to do follow ups? Just unpack appealing for us, please. Okay. So before I start with that question, let me give you the call center number. It's 0800-030-007. The call center agents were trained and just given the necessary knowledge and, and, and technical experience, and they'd be able to answer any calls in terms of access into the U filing system. And unfortunately, it has to be done in terms of security clearance. So the rightful person can capture information onto the system in terms of access denied. Now, as indicated the appeal process, um, my starting point is the AG report of the first three months of part one or phase one, where the AG indicated there was certain lack of internal controls or the internal controls wasn't adequate or up to scratch in terms of meeting the standards um, that we had in place. So we had to improve. And one of the things that we did in phase two, that our controls were strengthened to ensure that only those that meet the qualifying factor are gained access and allowed to claim benefits. Therefore, for phase two, prior to the opening of the portal, we obtained the subcodes. And unfortunately, the subcodes are the only external verification that we had to ensure that the business meet Annex J A. That's part one. Part two, if the portal rejects you, and the portal will give you an answer why it is rejecting you. It will say that you belong to a sector that is not pre-qualified for phase two. And if you have an individual feel dissatisfied and that you meet the uh, business activities as indicated in Annex J A, then you lodge an appeal. Now, no appeals is accepted online or accepted in terms of an email process because we had to control the calls coming in we will ask five security questions. And if you are deemed to be an employer, then you will given a link to lodge your appeal. So a person will phone into the call center. It will be prompt to, to, to press a certain button or a certain number. Once you gain access, then the security questions will take place. Then you'll be given a link. Then on the link is a pro forma and the pro forma will indicate certain basic information needed from the person. The person could be the employer or the representative of the employer. Now those basic information is somehow tells us that you are linked to the business activities. The second part of it is that you attach certain supporting or substantial aid your argument on the appeal pro forma. For example, registration, proof of registration. Two, you could have proof of registration with a particular CETA that will indicate you're part of tourism or you're part of liquor or you're part of hospitality. You can give any other supporting documentation that is linked, that will prove that you are given or that you link to the business activities. Now we said we had a turnaround days of five. Our turnaround period is five days. What we will do, we will look at the letter of appeal and we look at the supporting documentation. If for argument's sake, if you're in a liquor and you give us registration with the liquor board or you give us proof of purchase sales of, of liquor, then we will approve it, prove it based on your submission. Then we will send you a reply. Your appeal has been approved. You can go back onto the online portal. When you go back onto the online portal, there is a drop down box which says appeals proved. You click on that. If your registration number is equal to what is loaded, the system will allow you and you can load your claim and we will process it and pay you. That is the process. And the process allows for us to do due diligence and to ensure that only those that qualify that meets the criteria will be paid. And once again, I'm saying, we took our experience into account of phase one, where they were fraudulent claims. They were inflated salaries. 
they were employees they were never part of that establishment but made application on behalf of the establishment so take into account our experiences we tighten our controls and unfortunately we have to go to process because we are accountable in terms of who we pay and who we don't pay thank you over to you Alan, a lot of questions around this five working days from date of submission. We've had at least five people saying it's actually more like two weeks. Can you just let us know? They wanted to know, is there a delay? What's the cause of the delay? Is it actually 14 days or five days? Uh, yes, we opened the portal on the 6th, right? And we allowed employees a period of time to, to, to submit the application because initially, as I said, it was... Uh, at, uh, there was a lot of questions to and from. So we wanted that process to be 100%. Now we started the process on Monday. So for Monday, we starting with our five working days. For the first week, we opened the portal. We allowed employees to familiarize the, themselves with the process and also a time to obtain all the necessary documentations. We did send out a letter, but in spite of the letter, there was a lot of questions. So we allowed the first week from the 6th of April in terms of a cheating process for everyone both on the department side and the public side to familiarize the self with the process. We started on Monday. Our first setting of the appeal process will be this afternoon at past 12. And to date, we only received 132. There could be more that's coming to the process from the call center, but in terms of a committee, the committee received 132. Now that 132 will be finalized by Monday. A portion of it will be done today, the balance will be done tomorrow. And if, if there's any spillover, it will be finalized on Monday. Then we see what the second batch is. So most clients should receive responses that submitted in the initial period of the opening. They should receive a response either tomorrow afternoon or latest by Monday. And then by next week, they can load the application and then it will be processed. And then a lot of questions around foreign foreign employees. So foreign employees having access to tours, foreign nationals, applications not being processed. Can you just unpack that for us a little bit? Okay. Yeah, true. Now, once again, I have to go to back to the AG report. And the AG report always insisted on a verification source. You're paying foreign nationals, you're paying South African, South African citizens. What is your verification source? Because we're not looking at the person. We have no contact with the individual. We have no contact with the employee. All we see is paperwork, what is captured by the employer and what is processed on their system. So in terms of the AG recommendation, they wanted a verification source. Now, after the first three months, that is, you can say March, April, May, June, around July, we changed our system in terms of improving our controls. And those controls were put in place around about September when we started the second part of phase one in terms of payment. Now, in terms of verification source, the same principle that we subject a South African citizen, we will subject a foreign nationals. So there's no discrimination, there's no two rules, there's just one rule. Now the rule for identification verification by the external source, as was recommended, is either OMA first or South African Revenue Services. Now when we get a South African ID, we subject to verification with OMA first. It's a valid ID. The person is deceased, not deceased. The person is a warm body as such. That means there is no date of death. And then we check with South African Revenue Services in terms of, yes, were they registered with the employer and also in terms of CIR database. Now, the similar thing we do with the foreigner. With the foreigner, we check on you filing whether he was declared by the employer. One, tick. Two, we verify the foreign nationals against OMOFERS. If you find it, we pay. If we don't find it, we give a benefit of the doubt to the employer and do a check on South African revenue services. If it's found, stick, we pay. If we cannot find it, that foreign nationals number on OMOFERS or South African revenue services, we got no verification source. Right. So every foreigner should be registered with OMOFERS in terms of asylum seeker certificate or a work permit. And that's what we're using to verify. So yes, it's not that we are we are treating foreigners different from South Africans. No, we treat them equally. If you give me a South African ID, it's this numbers, 13 digits. We take that number and we subject it to OMOFERS. And if the 13 digits number of a South African citizen appears in OMOFERS, we know it's a warm body. So it's a control that we improve 
from lessons learned and we took into account the ages report to improve on our system. So unfortunately, the position of the department is very simple. We cannot find any record of your foreign nationals. How is the person living in the country? How is the person working in the country? What processes did the employer follow to ensure that the necessary documentation are in place? Thanks, Alan. Thank Go you. Over to you. You're immensely frustrated. If I can please ask you to add your questions in the Q&A folder and not in the chat. I'm not able to flick between the two. There are just too many of them. And please keep your questions to questions instead of statements. Yes, I know it's annoying you haven't been paid, but I need to go through 99 questions. Alan, can you please explain this sick uh, process? I know you unpacked a little bit when you started uh, talking. We have a lot of people who say they don't know what their sick code is supposed to be or they have changed their sick code, but the system doesn't reflect it. Just talk to me a little bit about that. Yes. When you go and register with South African Revenue Services, employers gave the zip codes. You find the zip codes in the RFP form, five form, right? So those documentation, those zip codes were given by the employer to South African Revenue Services and South African Revenue Services have it in the database. So if you ask me what is your zip code, I don't know what your zip code is. I don't know your business activities. It is what is in the database of a government entity, South African Revenue Services. And where did South African Revenue Services get those zip codes? It came from the employer themselves. Maybe not actually from the employer, but that person that was working with the employer or the representative of that employer. So when we got the zip codes, the zip codes were from the database. It wasn't changed for us because it's a foolproof system in terms of transferring information from one government entity to another government entity in terms of the memorandum of understanding or a memorandum of agreement that is in place and it's via a secure link. Now that zip code, it's a sector industrial classification. It tells you what line of business you are in. However, when we started with TAS, many people went and tried to change it but we don't know whether they change it for the right reasons or for the wrong reasons. In the same vein, when we started with TAS and we told the employers are not on our database, they went to you filing and registered the employees, which is incorrect. You can't register your employees at the time of application. The law says you register the employee when the person starts employment with you. It's in the same vein, I can say that if you lodge a claim with a private insurance company and you're claiming for a an, 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 an motor car accident, you do not sort out your premiums at the time of your application. So end of the day, we must take fault for our own action in terms of employer compliance. The compliance level of employees is not 100% or not even close to 100%. So we're trying to correct the situation as we are processing claims. If your zip code is wrong, when did you realize your zip codes were wrong? If you, if you did not have a zip code with, with a, a government entity, when did you realize you did not have your zip codes with a government entity? So we've got to ask ourselves these questions rather than saying, what is the purpose of the zip code? The zip codes tell you under which sector or which industrial sector you belong in, and we try to use it in line it with the business activities and line it with the three major sectors that we are covering in terms of phase two which is the hospitality, which is the tourism, and which is the liquor. So if your zip code is incorrect and you feel you should be paid, then follow the appeal process and give us documentation to prove that you are within the tourism, you are within hospitality, and you are within liquor. Thank you, over to you. Thanks, Alan. I just also want to draw attention to the chat. Nicolene has uh, given quite a good tip there. If you are wanting to make a change to that um, sick code, it's uh, her response is over there. Okay. Uh, right. A lot of people saying they haven't received their benefits. Um, there's two people in the company have, eight people in the company haven't, or they've received it inconsistently. They've tried to follow up without any success, um, that the call center number that we've given them doesn't give them any assistance. You mentioned these registrars by pro province, Alan, is that a better route to get hold of people to assist? Uh, the U filing champions that will, will assist you in terms of the U filing access and any technical issue on U filing. 
They are situated in every province. So if you contact the provincial office, they will uh, put you in touch with the youth fighting champions. And alternative, the second approach, you via go by the call center and the call center agent are uh, equipped to deal with youth filing issues. If not, there's an escalation route in terms of those that are sitting within the call center can attend to your problems. Your, your first part of it in terms of phase one in terms of non-payments. Now, with TIAS, when we designed the system at the start, we knew that volumes could be high. Now, if you look that we are approaching 13, 15 million transactions, or 15 million entries into the TIAS portal, that means they are claimed for 6, 15 million employees. And also in terms of employers, we're dealing with close to 300,000 employers. So we know in terms of volume, we couldn't handle it through the normal inquiry process. So what we did there, the TAS portal, the online portal is a self-help portal. If you lodge your claim, you can see it under saved employees. If you send in a CSV, it will say successfully loaded. When it's processed, it will be, your employees will be shown under saved employees. If it's paid, it will be shown under the payment breakdown. If it's not paid, it's shown under pending or rejection. Now, every non-payment is accompanied by an error description. Why we not pay? You have certain universal ones that affect every employees and the universal ones are just major two, your bank verification, because collectively we pay to the employer's bank account or the business bank account. So if your business, if your bank verification fails, it affects all employees. Your second part of it is in terms of blocks. Blocks could be in terms of the recommendation that we receive from AG that certain employees apply for deceased employees, certain employees are uh, employed for people that are or children that are under the age of 15. So you get those blocks. And you also get in terms of the follow the money blocks where certain employees are not cooperating with the audit firms. So those companies were blocked and will not be paid until they fully cooperate. And then you get other blocks in terms of normal investigation by the unemployment insurance fund that is done by a risk unit. So you get certain universal. But then in terms of specific cases, there's an error underneath each person. There's an error that you're not declared. There's an error that you deceased. Error DPSA, error overpayment. Now those things tells you why the person was not paid. And there has to be an action by the employer to correct those errors. If it's bank verification, you must take into account we do not verify bank accounts. We take information that is given by the employer and subject that to a verification, a bank verification process with the service provider, with the banks, by the service provider. If it's yes, we pay. If it's no, we do not pay. Now, there are errors. Look at the errors and determine how you can correct those errors. And as I said, if you have no declarations, go and declare. Now, when certain action is done in the front end, you, you capture certain things in the front end. It's a trigger. The system is built and designed in such a way there's a trigger. And when there's a trigger, that set of ID numbers is reprocessed or recycled. And if it's recycled, it is subjected back to the business rules. And we subject it back to the business rules and we meet the business rules, it is paid. So the key thing that I'm trying to say is we did not stop processing for part one. We only did not pay a certain number of people under phase one because they did not meet the business rules. So the aim of the access exercise is correct those, those errors and the system will rerun. However, having said that, before the end of the month, we're gonna send out a letter to all employers indicating those that are not paid and specific reasons attached to it and how they should correct in terms of assisting the employers going forward. And that process, we should be finished by the end of the month. So you have uh, um, a reason in terms of how to correct. So that is my process. It's a self-help scheme. So you go onto the portal and you find out on your rejection list and your pending list, what is the reason for not paying, correct that and it will be recycled. Thanks, Alan. So can you please elaborate what the process would be if the appeal is rejected and you need to claim on behalf of your employees by the normal UIF channels? Would the payments go to the employees or grouped and paid to the employer like under TERS? The normal process in terms of if you are rejected, right? And as I said, the directed covered three parts. It covered the sectors that qualify under TAS. 
It covers the vulnerable in terms of age, in terms of comorbidities, in terms of uh, isolation, quarantine, and that I said it will be open on the 22nd of this month. It's supposed to be open at 13, but certain issues have to be corrected between the government entities and be open in 22nd. If you do not meet the sector one, then you can go to the normal route. The normal route, the Unemployment Insurance Act, only allows payment to individuals. It doesn't allow payment to employers. Having said that, they are on, this, on the online portal or on the uh, platforms of the Department of Labor, the website. It indicates to the employer, you can submit bulk applications for reduced work time and temporary layoffs, which is easier on part of the employers going to the labor center and lodging individual claims. So yes, look at the online portal or not the online portal per se, but our web, uh, website, our platforms, our social media platforms. And there's a process to indicating to employers how to submit bulk applications through the unemployment insurance process in terms of temporary layoffs and, and reduced work time. Thank you, over to you. Sorry, Alan, I am jumping around a little bit. My apologies. Uh, a lot of questions around where one can find the, the sick codes. So sick codes, can you get them from SARS? Or look on your IRP5 form. Yes. Uh, Yes, and I think it's, it's, it's a Department of Trade and, trade and in Industry that normally, and there is a document, uh, I know we use a document, the booklet, the seventh edition, Sector Industrial Classification. Um, yes, and I think you'll find it under the DTI, Department of Trade and Industry. They should have it. You should have it in the website if you go under DTI, and if you go to the website, they should have those classifications. And as, as I said, if someone is, 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 is aggrieved by the sector codes and the claim is rejected online, follow the appeal process. But when you follow the appeal process, give us genuine supporting documentation to support your business. I'm in a hotel. I own a hotel chain. It's not, I'm being rejected and, and it's unfair rejection. Then give us documentation to prove that you're a hotel, which falls under the hospitality. Now, if I give you in terms of the uh, main division uh, that, is, that, is, that is allowed, right? is transportation and storage, accommodation, food and beverages, renting, renting and leasing activities, office administrative, office support and other services, travel agencies, tour operators, reservation services and related activities, other personal services that that's mainly belongs to the tourism and hospitality, retail sale of cultural and recreation goods and specialized stores, creative arts and entertainment activities, library, archive, museum, and other cultural activities, gambling and betting activities, sporting activities, amusement and recreation activities, retail sale of cultural and recreation goods and specialized stores um, that falls mainly under arts, entertainment, and recreation. And why a recreation sector? Because many beaches, many dams, many social events were closed down. And there were, wasn't, uh, you couldn't have those open concerts so therefore, recreation sector came into, into play. Agriculture, forestry, and fishing, manufacturing of beverages, wholesale and retail, transportation and storage, security and uh, what, what I mentioned falls under the liquor sector. Then you have security and investigation services, employment activities, services to building and landscape. Those that falls under the hospitality or tourism because you might have a cleaning services that is attached to the hotel group. Therefore, you talk about value added uh, activities. Now, the first thing you do, you go to the online portal and you submit your claim. If you submitted the incorrect sector, the portal will tell you that you corrected the incorrect sector, you should, you should click on that. If you registered with South African Revenue Services under that, it will tell you, you registered with South African Revenue Services as that, and that is not a qualifying sector then you got to decide whether it's right or wrong. Wrong meaning you want to claim and you're part of the business activities as NXAA. Then you follow the appeal processes but lodge your appeal by the call center and submit supporting documentation that will indicate to us that you are within hospitality, that you are within tourism, and that you are within the legacy. 
A couple Thank of you. Over to you. Uh, error messages. So the one one is error message application in progress and application not processed yet. This has been since December. So if somebody gets a message like that, application in progress, and we are now in April, and this was since since December, what would that be the cause of? Yes, uh, the key thing there is the bank verification. If, if, if an application is not, not processed, that means you couldn't process it because you failed bank verification. Now, I know that it might sound Greek to individuals that are looking at the portal. Therefore, I said before the end of the month, we're going to send out a letter to every employer on the TAS uh, database, and, and we will try to give a description to the error messages that is more user-friendly than currently is. Right? And we will guide the employer through the process, but mainly if your application is not in process uh, or was not processed to date, you couldn't process to date because you failed bank verification. Now that is what we're trying to do to improve the processes onto the system, is to give more detailed information. And if you allow us till the end of April, then we will correct those those little anomalies that come come up. Because yes, I do understand from a point of a layman, a person looking at that. Uh, it, it, he or she couldn't figure out what is what needs to be corrected. But that's a direct answer is that the bank verification is problematic. Now, the reason why bank verification is such an issue, because there were claims paid to employers. And after we paid it to employers, those claims were deemed to be fraudulent. And once a claim is fraudulent, then, then there's a lot of questions being asked by the investigative unit, whether it's an OX or SIU. So we're very careful when we pay we pay to bank accounts that can be verified. And the bank account should be attached to the employer, should be attached to the business, should be attached to the establishment. So that if the claim for some reason or another becomes fraudulent, then we can track the bank account through the banking process. And that can be done by the investigative unit. Thank you, over to you. Okay, uh, another error message around uh, applicant qualifies for no payment. Why is that? Could this be due to the fact that they don't have credit with UIF or that they are new with no employment or contribution history? No, credits doesn't come into play within TAS. TAS is credit free. You can TAS, you can say it's a bonus. Bonus, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say bonus very, uh, uh, I'm saying bonus in, in a very loose sense. That bonus is that they're given the days without deducting any days accumulated in terms of credit days. So even if you have one credit, you have a thousand credits, you have 500 credits, irrespective of the credit days, right? You are paid. So credits, once again, is not part of TAS. Now, why do we get a message? In March, April, when we made the first payment, employers made the mistake. Error means that, that the employer error was that they, they put on the form, uh, certain amount that are not deemed to be declared. For example, leave income should not be shown as remuneration during the month, where monies were taken out of the leave credits of the individual. Any advances given by the employer, the employee should not be shown. So it was shown, right? And we had to do underpayments. In some cases, it was genuine, and some cases it were not genuine. So when we reconfirm, so it could be there was an overpayment in the month of April, or there was an overpayment in the month of May. Now that overpayment was recorded onto the TAS system. And when we processed June, we said June we owe the person 700 rands, but the overpayment was sitting at 600 rands. So that 700 rands or 600 rands were offset from future payments. So when you offset the overpayment, the payment comes to zero, so nothing is entitled to the employees. So they could have got more the previous month, or they could have received payments which were not entitled to after an audit process, and that was deducted from further benefits. It doesn't in, in implies that your claim was not processed and paid. It says your claim was processed, but you're not entitled to any further payments because the overpayment was deducted. Once again, I'm saying maybe that error description, that doesn't fully cover what the intention is, but that's a direct answer and we're trying to correct the error messages to give a more user-friendly error message in the front end and that should be done by end of April. 
Thank but you. Over to you. Lots of questions around uh, staff that are on short time and whether employers can claim from UIF tours to top that up um, to pay their full salaries, essentially. Is that possible? You see, the, the TAS directive is very clear and simple. It says that what is given by the employer and what is given by the employee should not be more than the normal income of the person or the normal salary of the person. So we cannot give more than 100%. Now, if you look at the directive, the directive allows for rotation because the current cocktail regulation said there should be social distancing is still in force. So if you have a workforce of 100, you cannot have the entire 100 at your workplace because of social distancing. So there has to be a rotation of staff and rotation of staff will lead to reduced working time, will lead to reduced working hours, will lead to a, a lesser monies or amount of salary hand. So in that sense, in that sense, yes, there's loss of income, you can claim for it. So when you claim, there's three important information that is needed for the calculator. One, your monthly salary. Two, the lockdown period that you want to claim for. And three, what income, what remuneration you earn during the lockdown period. And you put it in there. And then the calculation is done and the benefit is paid out. So the answer is, as long as, it's, it's not a subsidy, we're not subsidizing wages. You must keep thinking we are not subsidizing wages. We're not subsidizing the employer. The key thing is, TERS is there for the benefit of the employee if he or she experiences a loss of income. Key thing, what is the normal income? What is the person earning now? Is the loss of income? If there's a loss of income, you can apply. The only problem is for phase two, is the sector base, and for the non-sector base is the vulnerable comorbidities and isolation quarantine. And if you do not meet, then you go via the normal UI route. Thank you, over to you. Uh, thanks. Okay, so uh, just see what else we've got here. We have got a ton of stuff. What about uh, employers who have done a bit of a stopgap, paid their staff uh, what they thought they were going to get back from tours and are now wanting tours to kind of supplement that back? Um, I've had a few questions around that. Yeah, I can only give you an answer in terms of the law, right? As I said, we're not here to subsidize wages. We're not here to subsidize the employer. TERS is the benefit of the employees. Now, the only amount or only description in the directive that is allowed and can be claimed back is on two levels. An advance given by the employer to the employees can be claimed back. And if any monies were taken out of the leave credits of the employee, then that can be claimed back and put back into the leave credits. If you look at all the directives and you read the directives, there's only two things allowed. And you must take into account what you declare to us should be what you declare to South African Revenue Services. You can't tell us it's an advance, UIF, and in your monthly declarations, in terms of your RAP5 forms or your biannual or your annual declaration to SARS, you show that as a remuneration because remuneration has a certain tax bracket and advances according to UI is tax-free because you're claiming it back. Any benefit from UI is tax-free, right? It's there, the entire amount goes to the employees. So you have to be careful. And therefore we had, we employed seven audit firms to go and do audits of employers to ensure that the information given to us is 100% in terms of accuracy, correctness. So end of the day, we don't want to hold back any money if it's deserving to the employer stroke employee. We will pay out. To date, we paid out 61 billion and we still continue to pay on top of the 61 billion. It is there to supplement. It's a reaction to lockdown and it's a reaction to the lockdown due to loss of income by employees. And we will cover the loss of income to employees as per the directive indicated. Alan? Right, once again, only two. So carry on. Okay, only two can be deducted back from the employer if it's declared as an advance or if the employer used leave credits and paid the employer. Those are the two that can be uh, recovered by the employer. 
Okay. Uh, I keep losing my. What do you? Yeah, there's so many questions here. Um, right. So, what are you? Am I correct that even if you haven't accumulated UIF credits, that this is not going to disadvantage you from a TERS perspective? So, let's say somebody only started working with you in April last year, hasn't accumulated the UIF credits. Can they still? Can you still apply for TERS on their behalf? Yes, as I said, if we, the key thing is a directive. The directive indicates credits are dealings. We're not touching your employment period. It is there for a particular reason. You are in employment and lockdown prevents you from working and earning an income. Now the lockdown is a, was a response to the virus. Tears is a response to the lockdown. If you are prevented from working, how are you going to supplement your income if the employer don't give you 100% of your income? So TERS is a response to the lockdown. So yes, credit days, period of employment, whether you work for one day, whether you work for one year, whether you work for 10 years, doesn't come into play. The key thing is you are prevented from working due to the lockdown. And as per the directives indicated. Okay, just a couple more questions around this appeal process. So let's say the, the appeal process has gone through, it's 14 days or five days, whatever it is. Do they get an email address to tell them what the status is? What is that process? And when you talk about 72 hours to submit, is this business hours? Is it, um, 70, is it 72 hours in general? Just uh, somebody wanting to, uh, to answer that. Okay, the outcome of the appeal to be notified by email right and the same email that you gave on the task portal or the same email that you gave in terms of submitting your appeals you'll be notified once you receive your appeal and it's approved and you want to go and lodge your claim on the online portal from that day you have 72 working days full day 24 hours 24 hours 24 hours you have 72 you can say it's, you can say it's roughly three working days so to allow for the administrative process to kick in in. That means we will inform ICT, this is a reference number of approved appeal, load that onto your system. When the person go back in the system, there'll be no issues. So we allow for that uh, uh, process in terms of if you give you an answer Monday, then by Thursday, you should, you should go in and lodge your claim. We're not saying that if you lodge your claim on Friday or Saturday or Sunday or Monday, it will be denied. We say don't go immediately, but go after 72 hours allow the three days in terms of um, the process to kick in where the, your reference number is given to ICT to load on to the system. Thank you, over to you. Great. Uh, we have received payments for April, May, June, so everything was approved as employer and individual. So a lot of this explain, so a lot of his explanations do carry water. Why did we not get our claims paid out for the rest of the month's payments under phase one? So April, May, June, happy days. Rest of phase one, not. What's the reason for that? Yeah, on phase value, I can give a reason, right? April, May, June, we do not do bank verification. We do bank validation. And therefore, most companies were paid on bank validation. After the AG's report, they indicated bank validation is not, uh, uh, not as control that we can rely on. There's too much gaps with bank validation. So we change to bank verification. Bank verification, we take your banking details and give it to the banking institution to verify it, whether that bank account belongs to that employer or that establishment or that business. If it comes back and pass, it fails. So the key answer for that, looking at face value, the only reason why we did not pay you is bank verification. There could be other little reasons, but if an entire set is not paid, then bank verification in, in, in fact affects the entire group. I have a few questions around so this, if, which is quite interesting. Sorry, Alan, to interrupt you. I know you're short on time. And that is, if you have staff members that are earning exactly the same amount of money and they are get, everyone's getting paid out, but they're all receiving different amounts. Why are they all receiving different amounts if their salary is exactly the same? Yeah, there, there are two reasons for that. Number one, you got to take into account the minimum wage. The minimum wage is 3,500. So it could be that at the end of the day, the person could receive the same amount, but where the salaries are different. But where the employer indicate the same salary, 
and the employee is getting something different. Now, in the initial periods, we took face value what the employer gave. If the employer gave 5,000 rand for person A, we took the 5,000 rands and we did the calculation. But after the AG's report, with the AG indicated from there, a checks and balances, certain employers were inflating the salary. Person A was earning 5,000 rands, but when the person lodged a claim, he said the person was earning 50, 15,000 rands. And that is what the firms of auditors are doing, is to collect the situation and collect back where employers inflated the salary. So what we did, we took the salary given by the employer and we verified it against the declaration of the employer. So we asked ourselves the question, why is the employer claiming 5,000 rands by a test when he's declaring, he's declaring 3,000 rands? So end of the day, we compare the salary of the employer against the declarations by the employer and we use the lower of the two salary, right? And if the employer can prove he made an error on the CIR, then we can correct that. But the question is that to, to, to eliminate the inflation of salaries by employer, we compared it. Now, the second portion of it that could be, as I said, I'm giving answers and face value because I don't have specifics to give a detailed answer on that particular problem. It could be that the, all, all of them was earning 5,000, but most of them worked during like, the month, the lockdown period, and earned a certain amount, and the amounts that they earned is different. Therefore, I said, what you get from us, what you get from the employer should not be more than the normal salary. So it could be for the, one of the three reasons, but in terms of the specific answers, I have to look at the specific case and the details of it. One could be the difference between your tax salary and your CIA declarations. The second part of it could be the lockdown period could be different, or the money's earned during the lockdown period could be different for each employees. And the third part of it could be the minimum wage is giving the same amount to every employee. Thank you, over to you. Quite a few questions around employees that have uh, been retrenched or have left. Uh, so employers wanting to know if they still need to claim for them and um, if they've been terminated on payroll, um, but they're still wanting to obviously give them the benefit of having TERS for months that they did work at the company. Or if you yourself are an employee, is it the expectation that the employer would still apply on your behalf for that stopgap? Uh, two parts. First part, TERS is only for those still in employment, right? So you only apply for TERS if the person is still in your employment. Once a person is terminated, then the individual is free to go and lodge the claim at any labor center or via our online process individually. However, having said that, we did allow for the task period in terms of a third option. If your services are terminated, an employer knows are terminated a thousand people, right? When we call that mass retrenchments due to economic reason, the entire business was closed down. So therefore there was a mass retrenchments. On the platforms, of the labor platforms, there is a process where you can apply for match retrench employees. And that will follow the normal UI route, not the TAS route. The TAS route is only for those still in employment. The UI, normal UI route is for terminated cases. So once you terminate the person, he falls off TAS and go via the UI X route. And the UI X route means the person can apply on his own or the employer can apply for the retrenchments, but Mass retrenchments, there is a process. You have to contact the provincial office and the provincial office will make the necessary arrangements to assist you in terms of the mass retrenchment application. I think the question is also Thank more you. around the fact when staff members were employed in that particular TERS period. So if I was employed at a company in mm -hmm. July and I haven't been paid out for TERS, mm -hmm. that company can still, and I was employed at the time, mm -hmm. if the company can um, apply for TERS on my behalf. Mm -hmm. They technically, yes. However, you got to take in the closure dates. All application for phase one is closed. The last closure date was 31st December or 30 December. That means no application could be received after 31st December. Then you have other closure dates as 25th September, 15th October, 30 October, and the last one was December. So if you did not apply, you might have a problem. But if you apply and you want to add an employee, you can do that. Adding employees to the already submitted application is allowed, 
but a brand new application will for the first time application is not allowed. So technically you can, because the person is still entitled to, but the main thing is that if you receive the money now, you must hand it over to the employee, right? So you don't apply and then keep it for yourself as an employer, because that is deemed to be unlawful. And the firm or auditors will ask you proof of transfer of payments to the employee. So if you apply and receive the money, which, which, which can happen and you do qualify, but you must show proof you hand it over to the employee. I think just on that point, Alan, if I may, one of the questions was around how do you prove that you've paid the money over to your employee if you are in a rural area, they don't have bank accounts, et cetera. I would assume proof on signature would be fine, Alan? Yes, you have to be very, very careful because the onus of you to prove, right? We, we, we do encourage electronic transfer. And, and it's very, 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 you know, the, the answer to a person don't have a bank account, it doesn't stand. Even in today, a person in the rural areas will have five bank accounts that compared to a person in the urban area will have one bank account. So we don't, we shouldn't indicate that because you're coming from an urban area, you don't have a bank account. In the today's South African environment, I think the majority of the population do have bank accounts. They do have bank accounts even, even for Sasa. Sasa do also encourage bank accounts. So yes, if you go the manual route, you got to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt because end of the day, they follow the money audit is there to ensure every cent received by the employee is transferred to the employee. Therefore, I said at the beginning, it's not there to subsidize wages. It's not there to sub subsidize business operation. It was there to compensate for loss of income to the employee and try to maintain uh, that business during that period. So when the economy opens up, the business still have, can still retain the same manpower or, or labor power and same skills levels and don't have to go a process of selection and recruitment. So yes, we don't encourage manual transfer. And I think most South African citizens are in position of bank account. If they don't have a bank account, they can open a bank account and it's allowed in terms of a savings account or a transmission account. What about employees that were declined for TERS because it says no contributions were received by SARS, even though contributions have in fact been paid to SARS? How do we correct this? Uh, you see, you ask me a question because we're getting the information from, from, from SARS. We have SARS, give us a declaration, give us a contributions level of every employer. So when we're checking for contributions against any company that is paying to SARS, that, that information is coming from SARS. So if you pay, there should be proof of SARS. And if you do not pay, then, then SARS will give us another return. But when we're matching against a SARS paying employee, we're matching against a database that came from SARS. Unless the SARS company is paying to, the SARS, uh, to, to UIF, then we match against a UIF database. So our databases are there. Even when we go to the vulnerable sector, we're going to match against Department of Health because it's expected in terms of compliance, in terms of tracking, the Department of Health is aware about every comorbidity case, is aware about isolation quarantine, is aware about the vulnerable sector because that will lead to the vaccination rollout, right? So we cannot pay for a person on tears and, and there's no linkage to Department of Health. The key thing is that we're trying, even this process has highlighted a few errors, in terms of an integrated government database. So when we punch in an ID number or when we punch in a foreign national ID number, it will give us a true reflection of that individual. And then we can, we can honestly, when we pay, we're paying to a wrong body that deserves a payment. Thank you, over to you. Right, so after hearing that TERS would not continue after October, our staff applied for normal UIF at the end of December. Then in February, the government decided to extend TERS again, but our staff who have received normal UIF payments could not apply for TERS. Is there no way our staff who could not apply for TERS for these five months can get their UIF credits back? Yeah, it's, 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 if you do not apply for normal UI, uh, TERS will not, will not stop you and, and will pay out. However, in one of the business rules, there's no double dipping. You can't get from UI and you can't get from TERS. So if you received from UI, you rather stop it if you, the person is still in employment. And if you are a qualifying employee, the key thing, you're a qualifying employee in terms of the sector. And then from the following month or following period, you can apply for TERS. But it wouldn't pay out the same period, both in TERS and UI. So it's problematic. Yes, we do understand. But we took into account when it was announced 
and we also took into account there could be applications. So if you are paid out, you are paid out. Right? There can be a, can't be a double dipping uh, portion of it, but we have to look at the amounts and maybe an underpayment is required from us, which we can do at the later stage because the calculation were different and the 3,500 did not come into play. So the right way to go about it, if you received, you can stop your UI benefits and for the balance of the period claim for TAS, uh, but make sure there is no double dipping because the system would, wouldn't allow double dipping. Thank you, over to you. Uh, I, I think um, I'm not, I don't sound otherwise, but I think I've got about five minutes left. Okay, let's make it count. Uh, or, or, let's just see, now I've got to try and pick you. Um, with regards to UIF reduced work time, for how many months would the company be able to claim on behalf of employees? Yes, UI is subject to credits. That's 100% and that is in terms of the UI Act. The maximum period a person can claim is 365 days, provided the person has the sufficient credits. So for if, you, you, if you work for four years continuously, then you should get credits for 60, 365 and the person can claim for 365 days. So that's that's a period in which you can claim UI benefits. Alan, is there a delay on the UIF payments? I've had a couple of people saying they've gone for normal UIF uh, December already, no movement on the application. What are the proper portals to use? Is there a delay happening essentially? Unfortunately, there is a delay because of the large number. What we do not take into account during lockdown is volume. Right. However, I will encourage people to go to the labor center and apply or through the, through, through, through the labor center portal and not through the online portal, because the online portal, as I said, you're getting a large number. And as I said, there is a delay because we do not anticipate the volumes, right? But we hope to finalize um, all, all outstanding payments, uh, either end of this month, if we cannot be done by this month, the latest by May. So by May, we should have it under control because as I said, in the last few months, due to allowing for, uh, there was no test from the 16th of October, there was a, a large in the thousands of application to the online post, uh, process. But allow us till end of April, or latest till, till May, and those things will be corrected in terms of going forward. And I think most of it from the beginning of the year, we did finalize and paid out because on a, on a daily basis, we have to give a report uh, to the command center and to NEDLAC in terms of what we paid, uh, both in numbers and rent values. There are most of, these, most of these questions, Alan, are around communications issues. So there are a lot of people who have problems who are trying to get hold of somebody to give them a response. I, I think 90% of the 147 questions that are still open here are around no response, contacting call center, no response, contacting email, no response. Maybe a question from me to you, and I understand the volume of queries that you are receiving. Are you managing to empower the call centers so that there are more people in there and they are able to answer the specific questions themselves? What plan do you have to deal with this volume of inquiry? Because it's not going to go anywhere, unfortunately. Yes, uh, three things. In terms of the call center, we, we, we outsource that. We do have a private company um, in terms of functioning at the call center. We do have a currently 291 agents. Further to that, we empowered the provincial office and collectively we have 1,350 staff in the nine provinces that deals with TAS. Um, the third part of it, as I said, we try to make the TAS portal a self-help process so that the person when he goes to the portal will understand the claim, the processing of the claim, the outcome of the claim, the payout to the claim, and what's to, still to be paid. So th that is our main fo focus, to make the online portal a, a self-sufficient, self-elf scheme or, uh, or device or, or avenue. In addition to that, what we are doing currently, and, and, and I think that we got DTEC. DTEC is a technical government technical advisory committee that is attached to National Treasury. They are assisting us with the process or giving us assistance. And we are developing a case management system. Now the case management system is in development and we launched around about the middle of May. And that portal or that case management 
will allow effective recording or submission or logging of inquiries, the tracking part of it, the escalation part of it, and automatic outcomes to employees. So that we will, we, be, we started the process, as I said, is, uh, is going through development and should be launched by May. And the fourth part of it, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to put something on the front end portal, will give a summary of the cases or claims lodged. And it will indicate what are the key reasons for non-payments for those individuals and the possible solution to overcome that. Now that we hope to do by, by end of April. And when that is done, we will send out a communication letter to every employer in terms of how to access it and, and, and to look at the specific reasons. Now, the key thing is that every claim that's received is processed. If we look at phase one up to 15 October, it's processed. There is no outstanding claim that is unprocessed. The only reason is non-payments attached to certain individuals and certain employers due to certain specific reasons. And that is what we're trying to unpack and, 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 and place and show in a particular sequence or, or, or information given that could be easily understood by the user and the user will be able to correct. Yes, and that, as I said, should be out by end of April and a communication letter will go out. In the meantime, as I said, the online portal was, was improved in a certain extent to give more information. And the key, key things, the two key things that are preventing payments are bank verification and blocks blocks by AG due to investigation. So if your company is not paid in terms of bulk, the key thing is bank verification. And with bank verification, we have a dedicated team that is sitting in the call center that only deals with bank verification. Now, we try to contact close to 10,000 employees with bank verification, but only 313 responded to our call. So some, for some way, the information given, right, or the, when we try to contact, we don't get the necessary replies. But having said that, hopefully with the improvements that we're gonna do end of the month and the case management system that is going to come out of GTAC will improve the situation. And we're not gonna stop paying. Once you lodge a claim, we will always review. So until everyone is paid or everyone that qualifies paid, we wouldn't stop paying the part one or part two in terms of the second phase. Alan, I know you Thank need you. to go. Thank you. I have two final questions. There are 151 that are open, but the first question is important because I think it's going to solve a lot of people's questions. If we take the questions that we have received and we rationalize them into themes, can you give us somebody in your department that can help us with the responses to those so we can put an FAQ together that can go out to the industry and they can use it as a reference? Would you be willing to give us a person, a warm body who can help us answer those? Yes, yes, I can, because we do have a team that work with the frequently asked questions. And we did put out uh, FAQ on our website. Great. Right? So they can indicate to us where are the gaps in the FAQ. And we also we also put out videos, etc. So if you send me a WhatsApp message, I will put you in contact with the two that are dealing with the frequently asked questions. And then we can develop something and then uh, that is directed specifically to your institution or organization or sector. And then we would take it from there. But definitely, uh, I Thank think. So I think in terms of this exercise, the more. Okay. okay, and the last question, and I had to ask it is: Will tours be extended after the fifteenth of March? Uh, that depends on the negotiation process. I mean, and there is a governance structure. It's a neglect subcommittee that that we report to or, or we attend, and 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 it depends in terms of interaction in that process. Uh, and I know that question was asked. It's, it's work in progress, but at the moment, I cannot say yes, definitely, no, it would not be extended. Uh, it's work in progress at the moment, and as I said, it's a net -like process that will determine whether we can go ahead and once we get the necessary buy-in or the green light, as they say, then it is presented to other structures, and from there, it is taken forward. At the moment, I would say it's work in progress, but I cannot give you which direction that process will lead to. Not giving anything away. Okay, I'm not going to take any time. We've got all the questions, guys. We I have recorded the session. We will put an FAQ together and we will release the recording. Chief, I'm gonna hand over to you. Well, thank you very much, Natalia. And thank you very much everyone for, for coming through and for attending for the questions that have been asked. Uh, we will um, 
as Natalia have said, put together the, the questions. I do work closely with Alan, uh, and uh, we'll make sure that those questions are answered and they're sent out to everyone. And thank you, Alan, for coming through. I know your schedule is busy. Uh, and as for whether the TS is going to be extended or not, uh, as Alan have said, we'll work through the NEDLEC process. I do see it in that process, uh, as we've done in the past uh, to get this extension so far. We will be looking into that. Uh, and of course, there's a whole lot of negotiation that goes into it. Uh, it's a work in progress, and hopefully we get it right. But thank you very much, uh, Alan. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, all those that have uh, participated. We will, if there's a need, uh, to put together another webinar that deals with issues of UIF. Uh, if there's a need for that, we will do so to make sure that all questions are, are answered. I think what's most important is that, um, uh, is what Alan has said, that you know everyone that have applied and everyone that qualifies to be paid will be paid. The process may take a little bit longer, but we will make sure that everyone that qualify is paid uh, because the reason for having this extension and the reason for UIFTS program is to make sure that the employees are assisted and they can put food on the table. So we will do whatever it takes to make sure that we reach you know, uh, you know, everyone that needs to be reached and everyone that qualifies. So thank you very much uh, you know, for this session and uh, we will see you next time.